actually want to pray before we start the Bible study tonight. Father, I thank you so much for this time. Lord, I thank you for, Lord, just letting us live in a country that mm -hmm. uh, you put it on people's hearts to serve, Lord, and to protect, Lord. And I just thank you for everyone here tonight. And I thank you that we have the opportunity to go through your word freely, Lord, without anybody telling us we can't, Lord. And I thank you for that. And Holy Spirit, I just pray you move among us in a mighty way, Lord, to help us pull out of it what you intend. And I just ask a fresh anointing upon me that I can teach it in such a way that pleases you, honors you, and lifts up and encourages those that hear it. In the name above all names, I pray. Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, if you can recall, we're in the Gospel of John. We're in chapter 12. We left off in verse 26. We're going to start in verse 27. But I want to do our regular thing where we kind of review what we went through uh, last week. If you recall, we, we got to the point where Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, right? You guys all remember that? Yep. And we talked about what the significance of that was in some of the verses that we looked at. You remember the reverse, the verse that talked about how when he come in for his triumphal entry, uh, entry, if I can speak, and they laid the palm branches down. You guys remember what I said, the palm branches, what that was a symbol of? Symbol of national power, culture, heritage, which really showed that they were looking for Jesus at that time coming back, not as a spiritual king, but they were looking at him as a conquering king, an earthly king, a political figure, somebody that would come in and get him out of the under the thumb of the Romans. Remember, we talked about all that, mm -hmm. and many of them just missed it that he truly was a spiritual king, and he truly was. He came for salvation, not for an earthly kingdom. And then we talked about that verse where it said, "We talked about old daughter Zion," and we talked about what all that meant, and we talked about the old daughter part was that children of God in Zion. You guys recall what I said, what we talked about what Zion was? It had two, it had a dual meanings, remember? It was a place, and we talked about it was a place, it was originally a fortress city on a hill that was in the Jebusites' hands, which were Gentiles. And King David, by the way, soldier, King David had come and took it over. All right, so it was a place, but it also had a spiritual meaning behind it. Zion, which ended up king, they called it king or city of David. Then it became Jerusalem, but also Zion has a spiritual meaning behind it. it. Means the dwelling place of God, or the city of God. And basically, that verse that we looked at was a fulfillment of prophecy. That it talked about the king is coming back to the dwelling place of God, the city of God. And the king was Jesus Christ. And that fulfilled all that prophecy. And he came riding in on what kind of animal? Donkey. Donkey. More specifically, donkey's cold. And we talked about that even had a meaning. Because if he truly was an earthly king, a conquering king, a king, he would have came in on a military horse, right? But he chose to come in on a donkey's colt, which meant that he came in peace. He didn't come to conquer. He didn't come to take over. He came in peace. He came to save. Little did they know, he came to die on a cross. Is he going to be a conquering king? Is he going to be an earthly king? Yes, but it's the second coming, not the first time. And then we talked about how all that fit to fit together. And then we looked at it towards the end of that, all those events, Jesus actually started really giving believers marching orders. You know, he talked about if a man truly does life, loop, uh, love his life, he will lose it. And we talked about what is he talking about? In other words, you're not going to be consumed by your earthly sinful life. You'll lose it and you'll follow me if you want to live eternal. And then he says, whoever serves me will follow me. And where 
you are, the servant is, he says, I will be there. We talked about what's the implications of that. If you're serving God and Jesus just gave you a promise that he will be there, what can we assume from that verse? If any, not just pastors, not just teachers, any of you, if you choose to serve God in any way, Jesus is going to be there. Jesus is going to be right in the middle of it. He's going to be helping you. He's going to be strengthening you. He's going to be guiding you. So that's kind of where we uh, left off last week. Is there any questions or comments before we start the study tonight? No? Okay. So we're going to pick it up in verse 27. Now these are Jesus' words. He says, Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say, Father? Save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. What is he speaking about here? What's the hour he's speaking of? He's going to the cross. Going to the cross, right? Well, let me ask you, how is it that Jesus' heart would be troubled? Why do you, why do you suppose Jesus' heart would be troubled? He's fully man and fully God. That's the answer he's looking for. That's it. He's fully man and fully God. And the fully man knew very well the agony and the torture of what the cross was going to be. Matter of fact, it doesn't, it doesn't record it in this gospel. In the other gospels, we know about the prayer in Gethsemane, right? right? You know, you've seen what he went through. Fully God and fully man. Now, I know our brain has a hard time wrapping around that. But you know what it means if he's fully man? He has the same anxieties, same fear, same stress. He knew what it was going to be like, but because he is fully God, he went through all that perfectly. And then he tells you, asks us a rhetorical question here. What shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? Because no, he knew this was the very reason he came incarnate in the flesh. You guys understand that, right? The sole reason for Jesus Christ being born of the Virgin Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit to come in the flesh was for this very hour to do this very task to go to the cross. Because here's something I think we take for granted and we don't think about. How faithful he was in doing that task because like the brother said, he was fully man too. Think about it. From a very young age, he knew that that's what awaited him. Could you imagine living your whole life and knowing that was ahead of you and that's what you were going to go do? But yet Jesus did it perfectly. Because he's fully God as well. By the way, and you guys know this, that's what uniquely qualifies him to be our Savior. Uniquely. Different than the Father. Because He became flesh. He knew all the temptations. He knew all the weaknesses. He has the same weaknesses, temptations, struggles that we will go through. But He went through them perfectly. Yes. Thus, the spotless, perfect Lamb of God that is a sufficient sacrifice for all sin of all mankind forever and ever. Amen. Isn't that amazing when you think about it? Because I think we just think, well, he's God, of course. He was fully man, too. Then verse 28, it says, Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. I want to read the next verse that goes along with that. The crowd that was there and heard it said, it had thundered, others said, an angel had spoken to him. I actually want to read one more verse because they all go together. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Does that remind you of anything? Amen. See, he didn't have to have an audible voice from God. He knew. That was for the benefit of the people. But I want you to notice where it said, some said it sounded like thunder. Others said it sounded like angel. See, it was for those who had discernment, those who had a heart of God. 
that heard it exactly the way it really went down from God, that it would strengthen their faith and make them even trust in Jesus Christ more. Just like when he prayed to the Father about bringing Lazarus from the dead, the Father spoke, he did it in a loud voice so everybody could hear. See? Well, that's like when he was baptized. That's the other time. Yeah. Said, and it's, uh, said the father said this is my son who I'm well pleased yeah it was for the people's benefit not for his benefit the one that heard the thunder had a hardened heart exactly that's the point that's the point and the ones that said it sounded like an angel they were hearing from God see that's that discernment I'm talking about thank you sister that's exactly right the other part of this see where he says Father, glorify your name. Does he say, Father, glorify my name? No. Even at this hour, he's concerned with bringing the Father glory. See? And then it says, then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it. Let's think about this. How does that happen? It's going to be glorified on the cross. That changes all all history is going to be glorified again when Jesus raises from the dead the resurrection is going to be glorified again when Jesus Christ ascends back into the heaven and he comes back into his full glory it's going to be glorified again when the gift of the Holy Spirit after he ascends into heaven is poured out and then it's going to be glorified even again when you think about the establishment of his kingdom by the power of the gospel message that comes with the Holy Spirit's presence. Mm -hmm. All of this was not possible unless Jesus went to the cross. It changed everything. It changed, it fixed the sin problem. It put us back in right standing with the Father it had to be done, like you've heard me say before, it had to be done so the Holy Spirit could be given. It had to be done so the gospel message that is the cross came with that power that accompanied it. It had to be done so people were attracted to the message of the cross and got saved. I have glorified it, and it will be glorified again. It's going to continue to be glorified. Every single time that somebody gets saved because of the original gospel message and the power of the cross, guess what happens? God's name is glorified again. Yes. Every time. And it's going to be glorified one more time that I haven't shared about here. What about Jesus' second coming? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But see, everything that I just spoke about, think about it for a minute. None of it. As we got too narrow of a picture, all we think about is salvation. Mm. But it has so many implications, yeah. as we'll see as we go in further verses, that all has to do with the work of the cross. <laughs> okay, I want to go to verse 30. Is there any questions or comments before I go to the next verse? Verse 31. Jesus said, well, I already said that. Excuse me. Verse 31. That's 30. Now is the time for judgment of the world. Now the prince of the world will be driven out. Okay. What is he talking about there? Because over and over and over we hear Jesus say what? I didn't, I, I didn't come to judge the world. I didn't come, come to condemn the world. I come to save the world. Mm -hmm. So why did he turn around here and now say, now is the time for judgment of the world? The because there were so many evil? To see who's standing with him and who isn't? Well, he's going to rid the world of sin by his death. All those inputs, all the inputs are on the right track, yes. Satan. Huh? talking about that prince up there is Satan. It is, which that's going to get in depth, but we're going to talk about the judgment. But you're right, right. But the, the time of judgment on this world, why is it now? This, is, this has got a spiritual meaning behind it. It's basically a, sta a spiritual statement. Judgments against anything that's anti-God. The spirit of the world. Everything that opposes God. Because he's getting ready to do the work of the cross. 
In other words, that judgment time has came. Anybody that's anti-God, anti-Christ spirit, that judgment is here now. Because guess what happens? Because of the work of the cross and what he's getting ready to do, you had an opportunity, okay? You had an opportunity. So in the final judgment, when the Father God, when we come before them and he's talking to the unsaved people, what he's going to say is the judgment had come against anything that was anti-God. My son came so you may be saved and you did not accept it. That's the judgment that he's speaking about. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's not the final judgment that is to come, but he's talking about in a spiritual context. Does that make sense? Yeah. And like Lord Lee said, the prince of the world. He's talking about Satan. He's talking about the devil. Mm -hmm. What does he mean that he will be driven out? Well, think about it. No longer, this is a spiritual thing too, no longer will Satan have spiritual influence over God's people. He's disarmed. He still will have, and he still has to this very day, to unsaved people. But no longer to the people who accept the word of Christ and accept the work of the cross, Satan's been driven out. Could no longer have claim over believers. Think about the comparison. That's another huge work of the cross. Think about Old Testament saints. They didn't have that. They didn't have all that. We do. We do. You understand, because of the work of the cross, that Satan has no power over you. The Bible says even all you have to say is flee, and he has to flee. Yeah. He can have no influence over you because of the work of the cross. Jesus Christ defeats death because of the work of the cross. Now I'm talking about spiritual death. I'm not talking about physical death. Does that all make sense? Is there any questions before we move to the next verse? See of all the implications of the work of the cross that I, you know, that maybe some of you knew all this, but but I think we don't really think about it at times. But that's why Jesus is breaking this all down in these different verses. Mm -hmm. Then he says something very interesting in verse 32. And at first glance, you might miss some of the, the meaning unless we really dig into it. But I, speaking of himself, Jesus Christ, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. Yeah. What's he talking about there? What's the lifted up he's talking about, do you think? The, the, when he arose from the grave. When he arose. From the it's, it's got dual meaning. One of it he's talking about, the lifted up that he's talking about, is he's going to be lifted up on the cross, literally. Right. Okay. The other thing is what you guys are talking about, when he ascends heaven. into heaven. And then he says, I will draw all men to myself. See, once again... The work of the cross has to be done before that drawing can come to Jesus. Because the Holy Spirit's given. The Holy Spirit woos people and tracks them to the gospel message. I could take you through uh, verses that specifically speak about when we, and we don't think about this, but when we share the gospel message. And what truly is the gospel message? You guys heard me say this, but if you just wanted to get a brief summary in a nutshell what the gospel message is. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Right. Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. Jesus Christ was born of the Virgin Mary. Jesus Christ died on a cross for every sin that was committed, will be committed, past, present, future. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ literally rose from the grave three days later. Jesus Christ literally 40 days after that ascended into the heaven and is at the right hand of the Father right now interceding on our behalf. That's really the whole gospel message. And anybody who puts their trust in Him will be saved. That's part of the gospel message. Everybody wants to hear that. What's the other part that's so hugely important? 
Repent and follow me. That's it. Repent. Repent and turn from your evil ways and put your trust in Him. Amen. People love hearing, oh man, I mean, I can be saved, I can go to heaven, I can be forgiven. They love that part. But they don't want to hear the part that now Jesus is your boss. He's your king. He's your Lord. And you've got to repent and turn from your evil ways and look at Him and live the life that He wants you to live. See, that's the whole gospel message. But you understand every time you share that, the Bible clearly says the power of God comes with the gospel message. All of those Old Testament animals that shed their blood couldn't say. Jesus was the only one that did qualify to shed blood because he's the Son of God. Amen. Amen. But I want you guys to think about that for a minute. The next time you try to share your faith, because what we say that in a way that, you know, really to share your faith, you're sharing the gospel message. It gets there eventually. You're sharing your faith. Sometimes it might start out with a testimony. It might start out, well, this is what God's done in my life. But if you really get the opportunity, it always leads to what? The cross. And what the whole gospel message really is. Understand this. When you share that message, there's a supernatural spiritual power and influence that comes with that message that goes towards that person. Paul talks about it. He talks about the gospel message comes along with the very power of God. It's not like talking to telling somebody what you ate for breakfast in the morning. When you start sharing this, God's power is with it. That's how it touches people. They get wooed and many times get saved. It's not about us, not about our strength, not about trying to talk them into it. And there's going to be people that you share with that don't want to hear it, just like we read right here. They didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to hear it. It's going to talk about that here in a little bit in the next few verses. Does all that make kind of, is that clear? Make sense? So it's got dual meanings. Cross and when he ascends into heaven. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. What kind of death? I just been five minutes talking about it. that kind of death. <clears throat> kind of death on a cross that has power. Kind of death on a cross that changes the course of history and everything that's going to happen in a believer's life. Here's something interesting. Verse 34. The crowd spoke up. We have heard from the law that the Christ will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Okay. A lot of interesting things going on here. Number one, once again, they're thinking, they, at least they got it enough that, that, that they thought he was saying he was going to die. Okay? Well, we thought that the, from, the, you know, from the law, in other words, from the Old Testament, we understand that Christ remains forever. How can you say you're going to die? Once again, they're confusing the first coming with the second coming. Because Bible prophecy in the Old Testament is very clear that the, the Messiah must die, on, must die on a cross for salvation. But it also talks about His kingdom lasting forever and remaining like they thought. But that's the second coming. That's when He comes back. And they missed so, all so that. Do Jewish people still believe he's going to be born of a virgin? <laughs> I see. I don't. I don't think they. Yeah. They, they, well, here's the here's the the sad thing. They believe in a Messiah. They believe in a Savior. They just do not believe that Jesus Christ was Him. They're still looking for the Messiah. They don't think he's came yet. They keep saying he must be the son of David. Well, guess what? If you really study, he come from the line of David. Yeah. He fulfilled it. How many times over the last four, five, six weeks we've been going through the Gospel of John have I read to you Old Testament prophecy and Jesus Christ fulfilled it perfectly exactly. But here's where they really kind of blew it all the time. They kept confusing His first coming with His second coming. Because they're like, 
What are you talking about? You can't be the Messiah. That's what this verse is saying. You're saying you're going to die? We, we know from the law that the Savior remains forever. Well, He will. By the way, He's not dead right now. He's in heaven. But He's going to come back and His kingdom will endure and will reign forever. It's just, that's the second coming. And then they turn around and say, the Son of Man must be lifted up. Who is this Son of Man? How many of you have a good handle on what the Son of Man means? Because we know He's the Son of God. We get that. But do you know that that's the term that Jesus uses the very most of any other term to describe Himself? He calls Himself the Son of Man. Over and over and over and over. So if you don't really understand what the Son of Man is all about, you're, you're, you're going to miss so much. So let me just kind of read to you a, a real short biblical de definition of what, what the difference is. If I can find my notes that are all tangled up below here. Okay, you know, we know the Son of God. You know, that emphasizes His divinity, His deity, and His part in the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But Son of Man, and I'm going to read it to you here in a minute, is actually from Daniel, and it emphasizes His humanity. See? Fully God, fully man. And emphasizes his messiahship savior okay and his purpose in coming to save us it points back to prophecy which is going to be fulfilled and it's in daniel chapter 7 verses 13 and 14 let me read this to you this is a vision that daniel had is there's a lot in this vision i'm not going to read it all but i want to read this section that's talking about the savior in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one white, what's that say? Son of, man. Son of man. Coming with the clouds of heaven. What does that sound like? The second, second coming. coming. All right, man, we're tracking. <laughs> he approached the Ancient of Days. Who's the Ancient of Days? The devil. Father God. Jesus. And was led into His presence. He was given authority and glory and sovereign power all over. All nations and peoples of every language worship Him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and His kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. That's the second coming. Son of man. See, that's the second coming of Jesus Christ. It points to Him being the Savior, Him the one that paid for it all. That's why He always referred to Himself as the Son of Man. Because that is a specific term of why He came to die on the cross. And what He will be doing at His second coming. And the crazy thing about it is they totally understood Son of God. They kept talking about well, you're going to have a kingdom forever. But, here's a prophecy right here that I just read you that says, Son of Man. What testament is that in? The Old Testament, right? So they have it, but they missed it. They missed it, see? That's why he always called himself the Son of Man. Did you guys know that? Isn't that interesting? Because I can remember when I first became a Christian, I kept thinking, why does he call himself, why does Jesus call himself Son of Man all the time? How come he doesn't refer to himself, I am the Messiah, I am the Son of God, because he is. But this, yeah. But it, 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 see, it all goes back to that prophecy that he prophesied about. The Son of Man. It said every tribe, every nation will worship him. Does that sound like a, a, a kingdom it's only for the Jews? No. For all men. See? They miss so much of this. They miss so much of this. So they're right. He is going to remain forever. Amen. His kingdom is going to be forever. Amen. And by the way, read the prophecy and you'll understand who the Son of Man is. Amen. See? They, they missed a lot of it. 
They're thinking, you can't be the Messiah. You can't be the one. And, and true people right now that are Jews that practice Judaism still believe this. Because they don't think he's, it was Jesus Christ. Verse 35. Then Jesus told them, you're going to have the light just a little while longer. Who's the light? Yeah. Jesus Christ. No worries, just telling them, I'm not going to be here much longer. Right. I'm going to be dying on the cross. After I've done the cross, I'm going to raise back to life by the power of God and the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of myself. Isn't that interesting? The Bible clearly says the resurrection, depending on what part of the Bible you read, that Jesus Christ was raised by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then it says he's raised by the power of God, the Father. And then it says he's raised by the power of himself, which is true. Oh, oh, That's the point. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Co-equal, eternal, forever and ever. All God. So he says, then Jesus told him, you're going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. The man who walks in the dark does not know where he's going. Now, is he talking about physically walking and seeing where you're going no, and running? See, himself. it's spiritual stuff again. Jesus so much time spoke in spiritual mm -hmm. things, spiritual context. But if you have a closed mind to that, you, you see none of it, see? That's what he's saying. If you don't have the light of the world, in other words, Jesus Christ, you're going to be in what? Spiritual darkness. You're not going to take advantage of the verse we read a little bit ago where Satan is kicked out. He's got no dominion over those who what? Follow the light. Listen to the light. Walk in the light. But if you don't walk in the light and you walk in the darkness, who are you walking in? You're walking under the control of Satan. The prince of this world... People don't like to hear this, but it was me included. People who are unsaved, they're under the power of the prince of this world. Yes. Satan. Right. And their fallen flesh. Right. Spiritual darkness, spiritual blindness. But, because of the glory that happened with the work of the cross, see how this all works? The work of the cross, that message can break that bondage and break that spiritual blindness and you accept the light and you walk in the light. Isn't that cool how that works? I know I'm a Bible nerd, but I think it's really, really cool. The more you study Scripture, guys, the more it comes alive, the more it all connects and the more it makes sense. You start seeing verses you thought had no reason to be connected to that verse. You're like, yeah, it does. You know, the whole Bible is the overall counsel of God. And it all goes together. And it all connects together. And sometimes we want to compartmentalize it. and try to. That's yeah. not really the way the Word of God is meant to be read. Yeah. It's the whole counsel of God. Amen? Amen? Let me see if I can get through like two more verses. Uh, I didn't do it, by the way. <laughs> then he goes on to verse 36 says put your trust in the light talk about himself while you have it so that you may become what's that say children of the light yeah. or, or this version says sons of the light same thing it's exactly what I just got to talking about when he had finished speaking Jesus left and hid himself from them see these people that were here just, now remember here's something we don't think about I just explained to you what we looked at last week. The triumphal entry, right? And all these people saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us. And all this, and you're thinking, man, they're really accepting Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Not a spiritual king. Because how are they reacting to everything he says? They're not putting their trust in him as spiritual king. True spiritual Messiah. Because they're saying like, oh, well, I thought you were going to never die. And, you know, they're, they're still not scared. They're not believing. They're looking for an earthly king, an earthly conqueror. And then it goes on verse 37. It says, 
even after Jesus had done all these miraculous signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. What are all the miraculous signs he's talking about? He's talking about every miracle we've read since the beginning of John. And think back about all the miracles and things that he's performed. He's made the lame walk. He's brought sight to the blind. He brought a dead man back from the grave. And they still don't want to believe. And there's only one person in the Bible ever that was prophesied about to do all those things. And who was it? The Messiah. Well, guess what? Sorry, guys. Just because you don't want it to be Jesus, it is Jesus. He's the one that's doing all this stuff. I think I'll leave up there. There's some really good stuff coming up, but I don't want to be rushed. I want to spend our time going through these next few verses. So the Lord willing, we'll probably finish up this chapter uh, next week. Is there any questions or comments before we leave? I yeah. have a question. Sure. Okay, I was reading, and I never noticed it before. Um, I forget what verse it was in. It, was, it said, it said, the Holy Spirit is your Father. And how did it go? I, I'm going to, anyway, the Holy, the Holy Spirit will, um, will make you get children. Something like that. I'm not sure what you're referring to. I mean, it, we got the it, Father, we got the Son, we got the Holy Spirit. Yeah, well, the it, Holy Spirit is giving to woo people unto Jesus, unto the well, Father. Well, it, it said that the Holy Spirit it, it's your fa it, it's the Father, and He is bringing you. I have yeah, never recalled seeing a verse like that. I, anyway. I, it's, um, yeah. Thirty-nine. Maybe. I'll find it. If, if but here's the important part: Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Spirit. But they're all what? One. God. One. They're God. Okay. They're God. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Comments. One of the things I have about the uh, Son of Man is he's also the descendant of, of Adam, and we are all doomed because of Adam. Yep. And through one man, all have our yep. sin. Yep. And through one, all have been saved. Very good. That's true. He's exactly right. Did you guys all hear that? Mm -hmm. Because of one man's sin, Adam, the beginning, mm -hmm. we're all doomed. Because of the other man, work of the cross, we all can be saved with Jesus Christ. Yeah. You know one of the, like how you're talking about um, like being 100% being a God and 100% man, like one of the, the amazing things is that like sometimes people like, oh, like nobody knows how I feel or things like that. Like the, the best thing is that Jesus knows Amen. because he felt all that kind of stuff. That's what and makes him unique. You know, when when a person Amen. sees another one, it's like they could just say, "Oh, I, 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 feel, I have sympathy for them. Like I feel sorry." But Jesus says, "You know what? I got empathy because right. I know how you feel. I know what you're going through." Like, and yeah. it's just amazing that yep. that that relationship is restored. Yep. And how um, we can just pour it out on to Him, Amen. and He'll give us peace in the midst Amen. of all that. Mm -hmm. That's what makes Him uniquely qualified, even from the bottom. Because he went through all kind of same things we did. So he understands when people are stressed. He understands when people are fearful. He understands when people are tempted. But he went through it perfectly. And guess what? That's what qualifies him to be our high priest. That's why the Bible says he intercedes on our behalf. He understands when we go through these things. Yes. You're exactly right, brother. Anybody else before I pray and we go ahead and leave? Nope. All right. Father, I thank you so much for this time, Lord. I thank you for this study we had. I thank you for Kobe coming and sharing with us, Lord. Yes. And Lord, I just pray that through the presence of your Holy Spirit, you will just speak to our hearts tonight. Help us to understand these verses more and more and more. And Lord, just strengthen us, guide us, Lord. And help us to understand that the, the cross and the gospel message, it's the power comes from you. You just simply want us to share and 
you do all the work and and help us not to get discouraged lord when we share and people don't accept yes, it because we got to remember that's not our job right. we just share and you do it either they're going to listen to the message or they're not but you're the one that does it and we thank you for that lord i just pray that you would just protect everybody in here and we give you the praise and the thanks for everything good in our life in the name above all names i pray jesus christ amen, amen. amen. thanks guys thanks.